I'm Trisha Heiss. Welcome to Community Matters. Today I have the opportunity to interview Mr. Brian Rickman. Brian has served our circuit as District Attorney for the Habersham, Rabin, and Stevens Counties. On October the 29th, 2015, Brian received a phone call that he'll never forget. He was informed that he has been selected and nominated by Governor Nathan Deal as the new appointment for the Georgia Court of Appeals. There were three positions available through the new legislative act, which enabled Georgia to have three new Court of Appeals judges. Brian went through that process, the interview process, and has been selected as our new Court of Appeals judge. Stay tuned as I talk to Brian about his North Georgia roots, about growing up here in the North Georgia area, attending Piedmont College, also going to the University of Georgia School of Law. He has served us well as district attorney here in the Mountain Judicial Circuit, and I'm going to ask him about his legacy, about how he feels that he can translate that legacy onto the Court of Appeals, about how he feels about facing a statewide campaign in the future, and also about his experiences at Piedmont College. Thank you so much for watching Now Habersham's Community Matters. Brian, thank you so much for taking your time to meet with us today. Um, and first of all, on the record, congratulations for your appointment. Thank you. Um, to the Court of Appeals. Of course, if you could just give us a little bit of background as to how the three um, vacancies on the Court of Appeals came to be. Um, well, of course, the legislature passed a statute uh, adding the court it, uh, currently exists at 12 members uh, after uh, a lot of talk, including a law review article that made the point that Georgia's appellate court is one of the busiest in the country. The legislature added three new positions uh, for three new judges uh, this past legislative session. Uh, and of course, the governor fills those slots. Thereafter, the judges will have to um, run for re-election at a later date, but that, that's kind of how we got here. Okay. Um, your swearing in will be at some point in the future. Are you privy to let our, our viewers know when that might be? Don't have a firm date yet. We are hearing sometime maybe mid-December. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to be down at the court today um, for the afternoon just to sort of get some information and get more timeline. So hopefully when I'm back tomorrow, I'll, I'll have a better idea of how everything's gonna, gonna play out. Okay. Um, and if you're sworn in prior to December the 31st of 2015, can you explain to the viewers when you will actually take the bench? Because I, I understand that the funding for your new possession actually doesn't go into effect until January 1st of 2016. Is that correct? That's my understanding as well. Um, I know that the judges will not hear cases at least till January. I'm not sure if there will be some supplemental funding so that the new judges can start work and spend a few weeks during December uh, interviewing staff members uh, and sort of getting settled in so that when January rolls around they'll be ready. Um, again, hopefully today we'll find out a little bit more about uh, timing and all that sort of stuff, which is important to me too because I. I want this community and also the people that work in my office to you know, have a little bit more grounded feeling about what's coming and transition and all that sort of stuff. Okay. What do you believe is your greatest impact or legacy um, by being district attorney here in the Mountain Judicial Circuit? You know, I would say, I would hope I can tell you what I would hope it would be with, okay. mo with most people. Um, we've had a lot happen just in, in my time, um, be it controversial cases or be it high profile cases. What I truly hope is not that people would say, you know, I was the best in the world to ever try a case or that people would say he did okay on, you know, when television cameras showed up. I would truly hope that people, whether they agreed with a decision I've ever made or disagreed, that they would say he never um, shied away from answering the question. He always was accountable and, and willing to stand and answer questions for what he did. He never hid behind his office doors or wouldn't take phone calls or didn't see people. He was accessible. 
Um, and that I was just genuine. That, to me, that would be all I would hope for, that, that people felt like I answered the questions, I answered the hard questions, and I made the hard decisions. Um, you know, this is not a job for the faint-hearted, obviously, and, and so I hope people feel like that when I made those tough decisions, when I answered the questions, you know, uh, I just am who I am, and that at least whether they agreed or disagreed, I was never afraid to say why, um, and I wasn't doing it because, you know, I was um, trying to further myself. I was just doing what I thought was right under the circumstances. Okay. What has been your greatest accomplishment as district attorney for Habersham, Raven, and Stevens counties? Gosh, that's a tough question. Um, you know, I guess if I had to point to one thing, as an accomplishment, I think it would be me changing as a prosecutor, and by that I mean embracing accountability courts and, and, and being open to figuring out that I don't know everything and being open to saying, gosh, I've been wrong about addiction. You know, when I was a young prosecutor, I thought uh, if someone's on methamphetamine, if you throw them in jail long enough, they'll get sick of jail and they'll just quit, and you and I both know that that's just not how it works. Um, so I would say you know, it's hard to point to one thing. Um, understanding that I haven't been right about everything uh, and understanding that there are better ways, just like the governor's criminal justice reform, uh, and being able to change, being able to not stay set in one rigid path of criminal justice and being open to saying, I've gotten some of this wrong um, on my philosophy. I think, I think that would be it. Do you have any regrets? And knowing that you probably do have some regrets, can you share at least one of those regrets that you've had um, experienced here as district attorney for the Mountain Judicial Circuit? Oh boy. As a general premise, there always, I think back to all the victims and all the murder cases, um, and there are some cases I regret not personally spending time more, being able to spend more time with those victims. Um, I think the Burton case will always be a regret of mine. Um, and I think not because, I think because I just wasn't able to budget my time to where I could be here with my people while that case was in court. You know, we had some folks on leave and um, so I think I'll always look back and wonder what I could have done different that to keep everybody, you know, the community, the victim's family, my office from going through that bit of controversy. Um, so I think that's probably about it. You know, I could, I could come up with, made plenty of mistakes. I could tell you lots of things I would do different, but I do often think about that case and, and think about how I could have, um, from a leadership standpoint, done a better job on that case. Taking your greatest accomplishments over the years um, as district attorney, as well as balancing those against the mistakes that you, you have stated that perhaps you've made, um, the regret, um, how do you feel that taking those learning experiences are going to be a starting point, a jumping point for um, your legacy on the bench as a Court of Appeals judge? You know, I think by and large, if, if, if I take anything with me to the Court of Appeals, we as lawyers and the public always talk about, oh, this person's a prosecutor, this one's a defense attorney, um, this one's a plaintiff's lawyer, this one's a defense lawyer. I think for me, if I take anything, it, it, it's a, a huge dose of reality. And by that I mean that in this job, you are so eyeball to eyeball, as we say, with the effect on regular citizens of the system, um, such that, you know, for example, when you step out of the courtroom, you know, we're in the room with a victim's family, or you may see a defendant's family in this community at Walmart, and you know how your actions absolutely directly impact people. And I think that at the Court of Appeals, you know, every opinion that I'll have the privilege of writing, that will be in my mind. That is, this is not just words on paper. This is not just 
an exercise in academic law. You know, when this, when this uh, opinion comes out, it's going to have real world impact on defendants, on victims, on all those people, citizens who depend on the system. And so um, that's a long winded way of saying uh, just reality, just the, the everyday impact that the system has. Um, on people, you know, I've been in a room before explaining to uh, explaining to victims' families, uh, you know, hey, this case may be reversed or it may be affirmed, and I've also represented defendants, you know, and explained, you know, as have you, you know, hey, we're going to appeal this. This is how it could go. So, just always keep it in my mind that there are real human beings that this system affects. What do you anticipate your life to be? like when you are on the bench um, on the Court of Appeals? Well, I think it's going to be it's going to be vastly different than the life as district attorney and that's something I'm going to have to be prepared for. Um, I think it will be a lot like I was trying to think of the analogy I told somebody. I've been driving down the interstate you know speeding at 120 miles an hour and I'm about to get off at an exit and stop at Cracker Barrel for a nice calm <laughs> Uh, and by that I don't mean the work won't be hard, it's just that you're much more insulated. I think if anything it'll be a more insulated existence. Um, you know, the judges don't obviously talk to the media like we're doing here and um, they're very limited and need to be guarded in their comments uh, for the integrity of the system. So uh, I think it's going to be the opposite extreme in a lot of ways. You know, I think I'll, most of all, I think it will be a quieter life for my family. Um, is that something that you welcome? It is. It is. Uh, particularly, you know, my wife and I are fine with dealing with it. My children are nine and seven, and they've reached the age where, um, and don't misunderstand me, but the, the community's wonderful. But there are times when they come home when a case has been on the TV news, and, and, and that's a lot for a child to absorb and say, you know, so-and-so told me that they saw you on TV, and there's a case about a baby and that's a lot for them to absorb even at a young age so I welcome that for them. I definitely welcome that for them. Something that you've hit on that I think is is almost um, contradictory and would seem to be very hard to reconcile and that is being insulated on the bench and not really having the access to media or not um, uh, in order to uphold the integrity of the judicial system on the appellate level, not having access to the media on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you facing a statewide election. Can you give us some insight into that? Because obviously over the past few years, you have run a re-election campaign for our circuit, Rabin, Habersham, Stevens counties, and now um, through the appointment process and after being on the bench for a certain period of time, you're going to be up for re-election and that will be a statewide campaign. So how, in your mind, how are we, you, going to uh, reconcile the lack of media access and also the hope of, of being a very long-term Court of Appeals judge and running a statewide campaign? Um. I got asked a question very similar to that during the interview process with the Judicial Nominating Commission, and here's the answer I gave, which by and large is the exact same answer. You know, I go into it just like I did district attorney, which is first and foremost, the best campaigning you can do is to work hard and do your job. And I promised myself when I became DA that while I would be responsive to the public, I wouldn't sit around worrying about politics all the time for the decision making and so I think the best way to run a statewide campaign is uh, work hard, work honestly, apply the law no matter you know call a ball a ball and call a strike a strike and the politics will take care of itself. That, that's kind of how I feel. That may be naive um, and quite frankly if someone were to ever run against me on the court who there are things that I'm not gonna do to, to win re-election. I never did them as district attorney. I'm not going to um, constantly tout myself. I'm not going to constantly 
um, send out flyers and mailers. You know, I would certainly do an appropriate campaign and would want to keep the seat, but um, it would be, I, would, I guess I would say, a very measured campaign. Here's who I am, here's who I'm from, here are the decisions that I've, uh, that I've found important in my life and leave it up to the people after that. I think that's the best way. Okay. Have you talked to or sought the confidence of anyone that has actually run a statewide campaign? Um, and the reason why I'm asking that question is because I've worked on statewide campaigns, but they've been, um, no disrespect to the court, but maybe they've been a little bit more high profile. Right. I, sometimes I feel like when I go to the ballot box and that court of appeals or the um, Georgia Supreme Court pops up, I kind of shook my, you know, shook my head or scratched Everybody my head. Everybody does. Who I is that? I <laughs> head a little bit, especially before I started really becoming more involved in politics. So um, is there a way to kind of educate the general public throughout the state about the, the Court of Appeals and the re-election process? Or is that something that, that isn't really, um, isn't necessarily a, a focus down in Atlanta in the Court of Appeals? I think the judges, and I've spoken to a couple of judges, they're certainly mindful that they're statewide elected officials, but I think my impression is it is even much more so a grassroots campaign. Uh, and by that I mean um, the canons of judicial conduct, you know, while Georgia has elected judges, you have to be very careful because, you know, it's inappropriate for a judge to run on a particular decision or to take a position. If you elect me, here's how I vote on these cases. That's completely inappropriate and shouldn't be done. So um, I think it's even more important than to get out and meet people, you know, to speak when you have an opportunity to go out and speak in the community. Um, you know, one handshake at a time. Let people just know what you're about. Uh, you shouldn't find and generally won't find judges on the Court of Appeals or Supreme Court staking out positions in an election because on the one hand they have to be elected on the other hand the canons prohibit that um, so it is an anomaly in some ways uh, but you know we're still very fortunate um, in Georgia that we do get to elect our judges and we do have a mechanism if they're uh, if they're not carrying out their duties as citizens as we feel that we still have that option you know federal judges are appointed for life so uh, no matter no matter what happens in in their career whether they work or don't work, impeachment is the only process for them so i think it's still a great system great you you've hit on something that i think is very important and that is grassroots um you are a self-proclaimed um uh, north georgia guy who um is you're obviously from this area, grew up down in Danielsville, Georgia. Is it that obvious? <laughs> well, when I say self-proclaimed, yeah, right. I mean, this is something that you appear to be very proud of. Absolutely. And having grown up in Danielsville, Georgia, can you talk, tell our viewers about your undergraduate experience and then about your law school experience? But I think that it's very important, especially to people in our circuit to know um, that having those local ties and having grown up in a non-metropolitan area is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And also having experienced local education is a wonderful thing. So this is your opportunity to kind of um, not only plug your North Georgia roots, but also to, to, to talk, please, a little bit about your experiences at Piedmont College and your um, service as a, on the board of trustees for that college. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I said the other day, I, I'm nothing if not a Piedmont College success story. You know, when I came to Piedmont, uh, I was working part-time in the DA's office in Banks County um, while I went to undergrad at, at Piedmont. And my original intention was simply to go and get that piece of paper, get a bachelor's degree and move on to, at the time I thought about um, potentially federal law enforcement, you know, Secret Service. I have a cousin that works for the Secret Service. Um, I thought of all sorts of different things, and um, a lot happened to me there. You know, I, I, that's where, uh, for example, the first time I read Letter from Birmingham Jail by Dr. King and thought about 
justice issues, and, and that would be where I uh, thought about law school. Um, that would be where I dug in and got in a lot more interested in hit the history of Northeast Georgia. Um, so it just set off a lot of light bulbs in my, in my head. And Piedmont, um, I graduated in 1998, was accepted into the University of Georgia School of Law. Um, and it was just such a, one of the great things, not just about Piedmont, but a smaller college experience, you know, it, everybody has to find their own, what they feel comfortable. Just for me personally, you know, it's a lot like a small town, uh, all excited when somebody local does good, you know, so there were a lot of, you know, you see people in the hall, hey, congratulations on law school, you know, just like it is now. I tell people also that my Northeast Georgia roots, you know, when I was in law school, my dad worked two jobs my whole life. And so uh, law school's tough, but the law library at the University of Georgia wasn't so bad after sitting on a bulldozer with him in the 105 degree Madison County heat. I would tell my friends, look, this is gravy. <laughs> this is, you know, there, there's a world out there of people who every day um, go home with calluses on their hands and, and can barely keep their head up to eat supper. So we should be thankful that we're sitting in this air-conditioned law library. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how I did it. I used to tell myself when I would, you know, complain or whine, um, hey, this is a privilege. Um, tell us, if you don't mind, a little bit about your work for the Piedmont College Board of Trustees and about how important that is to you, especially for a smaller local um, college system. It's great. You know, I've been honored uh, that I've been on the board for a few years. Um, it's just wonderful. I never thought when I was a student carrying a backpack through that someday I'd be on the board. Um, I do feel, I hope it's an appropriate sense of, um, that's one of the few areas I feel like where you'll see me market myself as horrible as that is to say, but that's because I want people to know that P the, a Piedmont degree can take you anywhere that any other degree can, and I'm living proof of that. Um, so that's one of the few ways where I'll be comfortable in saying, look at me and look what I've done. <laughs> um, but I just love it. I just love it. It, it like I said, so many um, learning experiences, so many um, experiences in professors that I was fascinated with and topics I was fascinated with, and uh, just a great place. Every time I go there, I get excited. Great. Well, we, of course, appreciate your time today, and you have been a great friend of Now Habersham, and um, of course are a great friend of me and my family, and so we have extended to you and continue, continue to extend to you and your family congratulations on this well-deserved appointment. Um, do you know who you're going to be working with? I understand that the Court of Appeals has a three-judge panel that will be assigned um, in the future. Does that mean that you and the two other well-deserving uh, candidates who have been appointed will all serve together, or is it kind of going to be a fruit oh, basket? Oh, no, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to fold the new people into experience panels. Um, if you look at the Court of Appeals website, you can see the panels for the new year, and then on some of the panels you'll see a number. Like you might see two names and then a one, two names and then a two. Those one, twos, and threes are the, the three of us. And so um, depending on who's sworn in first, second, or third, that will be the panel that you'll go to, which I think is randomly decided what order you get sworn into. And so, no, if they put all three of us on one panel, it, 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 there could be some challenges. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even know where to park yet or where the bathroom is. So. That's pretty, that's pretty interesting and also awesome at the same time. Right. Well, thank you very much for your time today. We greatly appreciate it. Do you have any departing words for our viewers? No, just that, um, just that I want everybody to know that I will be at work until I'm sworn in. I'm very sensitive and want people to know that I'm, I'm committed that this isn't too much of a distraction for the DA's office. Um, and that, you know, as far as whatever happens down the line for who the next DA is, I'm, I'm going to work very hard on transition issues. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want people to think I'm just already looking forward to the next adventure and not, I love the office so much that uh, I will be in court. I'll be calling a calendar. You, you will see me taking pleas and working right up until, right up until it's time. So I definitely want people to know that.
Perfect. Thank you so much, Brian Rickman, our district attorney for the Mountain Judicial Circuit. Congratulations on your appointment to the Court of Appeals. Hopefully, um, we'll be following up. Um, of course, you won't be able to do an interview, but um, hopefully I will be able to do a follow-up segment about um, you being sworn in. And so congratulations to Maggie and, of course, your two young, beautiful children. We're very excited and happy Thank you for so you. Much. And, of course, as a North Georgia resident and a resident of the Mountain Judicial Circuit, I cannot tell you how excited and proud we are that someone local in our community has been selected for this, this great honor. So congratulations and thank you again for your time. Thank you so much.